You guys ready to start? Let's go. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our featured uh, presentation on Australia and Mexico. My name is Michelle Cobb. I'm the Director of Global Programs. I'm Noah Cutchins, Associate Program Director at UCAP. My name is Luke Seacom. I'm Resident Director for Australia and New Zealand. Hi, everyone. I am Veronica Tellez from the Mexico Study Center. And I'm Lucia Rayas, a history professor in the program. Uh, before we get going to get started, we're going to do something a little bit different today and use a separate platform. Uh, this is called Slido. So I would encourage you all to either sign on to slido.com uh, and use this number here, 41972245, as your session number, or just take your phone out and take a shot of that QR code. Um, we'd encourage you to join the conversation, ask questions as we're going throughout. We've got a, a team of very knowledgeable people answering questions as we go. Uh, so please feel free to engage with this, with this particular platform. Thanks, Luke. Okay, so we're gonna just talk a little bit about why Mexico and Australia for recruitment priorities. So back in October of 2022, a small UCAP work group was uh, created to develop strategic priorities. And our goal was to have a measurable period of recruitment uh, based on a select number of locations, disciplines, and concepts. So the criteria the team came up with are these bullet points that you can see on the slide, uh, program capacity, course availability, strategic importance for the state of California, so by December of 2022, the work group proposed featuring five recruitment and outreach priorities, and we were focusing on a three-year cycle. So those five recruitment priorities are Australia, Mexico, environmental science, um, summer STEM, and first generation. We have been collaborating closely with the marketing communication and engagement team to highlight these priorities. But today in this presentation, we are focusing on the unique features of program offerings in both Mexico and Australia. Some of the other priorities such as environmental science and first generation are intertwined in our offerings for these two countries. So we'll be starting down under and then our colleagues for the Mexico program will share more about the offerings in Mexico. As you can see in the chart in the upper right, students going to Australia represented almost three and a half percent of UCAP's overall enrollment. We're hoping to soon reach the pre-pandemic numbers again and continue growing. So we have lots of high goals. We've made some changes in our efforts to attract more UC students to Australia to reach our goal of increased enrollment. So you can see on the bullets here, these are just some of our more recent um, efforts to make changes to try to basically overall expand availability to students. So whether it be offering more programs to sophomores, adding quarter options at UNSW, um, enhancing the website information, all of these different areas are different efforts to try to reach out to more UC students and, and find out what their interests are and try to serve them better. And these are just six examples of the recent changes. One area of potential growth that we're investigating right now is hoping to expand and offer a summer science research program. So details coming soon, hopefully. We hope you leave this presentation with a greater knowledge of these three areas um, that we are hoping to highlight with the Australia programs. The wide variety of courses in English and area of study, the geographic and cultural diversity, which random fact, um, almost 30% of Australians are born overseas. So I found that interesting. Um, but also a stronger focus and awareness of indigenous courses. We've been really trying to find ways to bring more awareness to the many opportunities students have to learn about the indigenous cu cultures offered through our partner universities. They have language classes, um, dance classes, culture, a wide variety. And there's also a number of immersion experiences students can sign up to attend 
which some are even overnight excursions. So I would strongly encourage your students to consider taking an indigenous focused course while abroad. But now I would like to introduce our new resident, newer resident director for Australia and New Zealand, Luke Seacombe. Luke started his own study abroad journey on exchange at the University of Oregon as part of his master's program. He also later completed a short study tour in South Korea before leading a two week volunteer program in Sri Lanka. He has more than 10 years of experience and is highly motivated with a focus on empowering people through education and international immersive experiences. Luke has already placed a big emphasis on improving the way UCAP presents Australia in our promotional efforts and on our website. He's also been working really closely with the specialists to better advise our students. And he's very open to being a resource and happy to meet with the advisors at any or all of the campus offices. So feel free to reach out to him at any point. But in the meantime, I will let Luke share more about the Australia programs. Thank you so much, Michelle. And what a great way for me to start my morning with a, just like a pump up like that, I feel great. Um, <laughs> now, before I get started, uh, it's really important um, that I just acknowledge uh, do acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connection to land, water and communities. Today I'm coming to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay our respect to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and cultures today. Um, before I, before I take you on a journey up the east coast of Australia with stops at each of our partner universities, I really wanted to take a few moments to highlight one of the most unique and incredible aspects of Australia. When I, when I meet with students for the first time when they just land and start their exchange, this is something really important that I like to highlight um, to help them really put into context the significance of this experience and the location they've chosen to study in. Australia's first people have been living on the continent for a millennia. In fact, they are the world's oldest surviving cultures, cultures that continue to be expressed in dynamic and contemporary ways even today. Australia's, first, uh, Australia's Indigenous people are two distinct cultural groups made up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. But there is great diversity within these two broadly described groups with over 250 different languages, beliefs and customs uh, spread across the nation. Uh, UCEAP partner universities operate on four distinct lands that are home to their own unique people. So in Brisbane, we have the Turrbal and the Yigara people. In Sydney, we've got the, Kata the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. In Canberra, we have the Ngunnawal and the Gambri. And as I mentioned earlier, in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So again, I extend my, um, I extend my acknowledgement to them uh, and really want to highlight the importance um, that this has on a student's experience when in country. So I want to go through some facts about uh, studying Australia before I really deep dive each of the universities. So here are some, here are six key facts about studying Australia. Our education institutions may be relatively young compared with universities such as the University of Bologna, which was established in 1088, or the University of Oxford, which was established in 1096. Despite this, we are still up there with the best. Australia has six of the world's top 50 universities, all uh, USEP partners fall within that. So all of the Australian partners um, uh, within that top 50. Uh, Australia is an outstanding higher education system with over 22,000 courses across 1,100 institutions. Our system is ranked ninth in the 2021 U21 ranking of national higher education systems higher than the world's traditional powerhouses in education, such as France, Germany, and Norway. Not only does Australia offer a quality education, we also provide exceptionally high experiences outside of the classroom. International students report a 93% satisfaction scores for their overall experience while living and studying in Australia, according to the 2022 Australian Department of Education Student Experience Survey. This is actually up 2% from 2021. So we're slowly growing. Um, some more facts. So we know that students studying down under rate their experience highly, but how does Australia really rate in comparison to other locations? Well, it turns out fantastic. According to the QS Best Student Cities 2024, 
All of Australia's major cities are in the top 90 student cities around the world. All of the partner, USAP partner universities are in the top 30 and two of those being in the top 10. So it really is a great place to study. Australia provides world-leading education in many study areas. The Times Higher Education World University rankings rate Australia institutions highly in the following fields in particular. Arts and humanities, clinical and preclinical and health, engineering and technology, life sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences. So there's really strong education across the board. Further to the formal learning experience, Australia offers a mix of thriving cities, open spaces, regional centres, and unique landscapes. The first thing you may notice when you land in Australia is our fresh air and blue skies. We have a long history of protecting the beauty and sustainability of our natural environment. The, the result is clean, livable cities and populous regions balanced with plenty of green space. A diverse natural environment offers a range of experiences. You can relax on the golden beaches, venture into the national park, or see unique plants and animals and explore the untamed outback. In fact, 80% of animals in Australia are unique to the country and conservation programs are extensive. So there's plenty for wildlife enthusiasts to do and see. Uh, I'm now really gonna talk through our partner universities and we're gonna venture up the East Coast starting in the cultural, sporting and fashion capital of Melbourne uh, and concluding in the beautiful beaches of Queensland. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're yet to do so, you can see the QR code at the bottom of that slide there at the bottom left. Um, please take a photo of that, ask questions as we're going. Someone will answer. If not, I will be able to answer at the end. But please feel free to ask any questions you may have. So Melbourne is known as the literature, style and sporting capital of Australia and was named the most livable city in the world seven years in a row. There's no shortage of things to do from feeding koalas and kangaroos at moonlit sanctuaries and exploring the famous graffiti landways of the CBD to seeing the world's biggest tennis stars at the Australian Open. There's always something happening in Melbourne. If you want to get outside the city, less than two hours travel is Bells Beach, home for the world-class Rip Curl Pro Surfing event, the vineyards of the Yarra, Van Yarra, Yarra Valley, the mineral pools of Hepburn Springs. Taking everything you need in your backpack and sleeping under the stars at Wilson's Prom or the Otway Ranges is a highlight for many, many people. So the University of Melbourne. This is Australia's number one ranked university and has over 100 research centres and excels in areas of medicine, business, education, and social science, amongst others. It's located in the heart of the biomedical precinct of the Southern Hemisphere, which may complement students who are interested in studying in that particular field. As I mentioned, the University of Melbourne is the number one ranked university in the country. It's ranked in the top 20 internationally for 14 different disciplines and a central part of Melbourne from its earliest days. It really is in the fabric of the city. If students are focusing on their major, the University of Melbourne's exchange and study abroad program is very flexible, allowing students to choose units from pretty much most degrees across different schools and faculties. If students have flexibility, uh, why not try one of these really unique experience courses? We've got uh, street art, which is one of the most popular ones, introduction to climate change, Australian indigenous politics, and a new unit that they've just introduced, beer styles and sensory analysis. So heading north from Melbourne, we are venturing up to Sydney. Now, Sydney is known for its opera house and the Harbour Bridge. However, there is so much more than just that. It is one of the best student cities in the world. In fact, in 2021, it was ranked the fourth most, fourth most desirable place in the world to live and study. As Australia's financial and economic centre, it offers endless opportunities for their, those ambitious and entrepreneurial. It is Australia's largest and mo most popular city. It's situated in sprawling waterways where sailboats will moor past skyscrapers. Sydney is undeniably an exciting destination. It's always sunny, it's vibrant, it's proudly diverse. More people, um, more people living in Sydney were actually born outside of Australia, as Michelle mentioned earlier. Uh, take a walk down Circular Quay, a bus to Bondi Beach or a train to the Blue Mountains and you have still only scratched the surface. There is so much to do. Now we've got two university or two partners in Sydney. One of our two partners is the University of New South Wales or UNSW, which is located just a short walk from the famous Coogee Beach in Kensington, a suburb with a strong sense of community. UNSW offers a variety of opportunities to volunteer either on campus or with external not-for-profit organizations. 
In addition to that, there's some 200 student clubs and societies. So it's the perfect place for someone to come and build that really strong tribe and network. As home to arguably the best business school in Australia, UNSW is one of those go-to destinations for business majors. Unlike our other Australian partners, the UNSW full term is offered as a quarter program. It's really tailored, it can be tailored for students to take one course in summer over the January period and then three, course in the three courses in the standard term. Sorry, I got distracted. There's a UNS UNSW alumni here, which I'm glad to see. Um, if students have flexibility in their degree, why not study one of these really unique experiences uh, to UNSW? We've got doing film festivals, which sounds incredible. Introduction to aircraft engineering, the science of indigenous knowledges, and Sydney, history, landscapes, and people. Heading a little bit to the west from UNSW, and we've got our second Sydney partner, the University of Sydney. This is actually Australia's oldest university. It's close to downtown. The University of Sydney is a popular location with students from all majors, but especially those who really want to participate in an internship or placement for academic credit. As a bonus um, for those students, the staff will actually help find that internship or placement. So it's a very easy experience for students. Um, and they'll help them based on their major and interests. So not just the study side of things, but also what they want to do and what their interests are. Home to one of the most photographed quads in the country. You can see it there in the bottom left of those photos. Um, the University of Sydney is the perfect destination for students who want to experience that big city lifestyle. Again, if students have flexibility in, the, in their degree, there's some incredible units that they can undertake. Uh, Electroacoustic music, video game design, contemporary indigenous arts, D and colonizing indigenous, indigenous education, and intro to artificial intelligence, which I'm sure more and more people are going to start to enroll in. Now we're gonna to go to the city of Canberra. The small yet mighty capital of Canberra is the city that punches far above its weight. Uh, Canberra is home to Parliament House and all 16 of the country's federal agencies, including the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Nearly 20,000 international students from over 100 countries choose to study here and Canberra is home to more than 100 embassies and diplomatic missions. Australia's capital was once a beige home to politics and bureaucrats for the brief periods that Parliament was even in session, but times have changed and the city can now boast hip hotels, thriving dining scene, and in my opinion, some of the greatest galleries, museum and historical sites in the country. It really is a fantastic place. The Australian National University, or ANU, is one of Australia's top-ranked universities, ranking in the top 100 in all reputable measures across all ranking um, bodies. This is a fantastic place to be if you are interested in government, politics, or diplomacy. ANU courses are taught in real small classes, state-of-the-art collaborative spaces that help to really stimulate students to think a little bit differently. ANU also offers a range of opportunities for internships for exchange with the ACT state government, embassies, NGOs, think tanks, and research centers. Now, this used, to, this used to be a compulsory aspect of the exchange, and we've now removed that aspect, so it isn't compulsory. However, it is still open, and there are some incredible, incredible things that students can do. Um, if students do have flexibility in their degree, uh, fundamentals of nuclear radiation is a very popular unit, astronomy and space, Australia, uh, Australian archaeology and contemporary Australia Indigenous music studies. So four really unique units to that institution. Now, I mentioned and Michelle mentioned earlier about the internships that are available. I really wanted to highlight some of the actual incredible opportunities if students do want to go down that path and take an internship. Um, some of the potential projects that students can be involved in, and there are hundreds, and I just chose three that really stood out to me. So the Reimagine Project is one of them. ANU has embarked on a major initiative to reimagine the role of engineering and computing in the 21st century. The Reimagine Project aims to get us thinking about what our world will look like in 2050 when we are completing, uh, when we're completely embedded in both the digital and physical environment, and to encourage us to shame, to change and shape the new intellectual agenda. So it's something that's becoming increasingly important. Through the Innovation Institute. There's a project called the Wear Optimo Project. Wear Optimo was a project established to drive the future of personalized medicine and diagnostics via microscopic wearable technology. 
the aim of the project is to provide simple wearable devices like a watch or a bracelet or a necklace, which can help monitor and manage human health conditions, which is incredible. Uh, the last one is the ANU Institute of Space. Now, last, last term, we actually had one of the UC students who did their internship through the Institute of Space. And after chatting with her, I, I needed to make sure that this was highlighted. The InSpace consolidates, streamlines, and coordinates all space-related activity across the ANU and supports the Australian government's objective to transform the Australian space industry and treble its workforce by 2030. InSpace bridges academia and industry and is a driving industry and government co-investment in projects that support the growth of gro globally competitive and, res and respected Australian space industry. So these are just some of the incredible opportunities that are available for students if they are interested in studying it at ANU. So we're going to head north. We're going to follow the sun and the beaches, and we're going to head up to Brisbane. So Brisbane, pronounced Brisbane, despite how it is spelled, it is Brisbane, um, is the capital city and state of Queensland and is located in the tropical northeast part of the country. Home to hundreds of nationalities and over 200 languages, Brisbane is one of the greenest cities in the country. It is not just the city that is special. Queensland is also home to five UNESCO World Heritage listed sites, the, uh, the most famous obviously being the Great Barrier Reef. Young and progressive, the city is fast becoming the center in, uh, a center in the Asia Pacific for business, investment, major events, and education. Outside of the city, you can discover all that Queensland had to offer. You'd head south to the golden sands of the Golden Gold Coast and Byron Bay, north to the world's oldest rainforest, the Daintree Rainforest, which I think was 135 million years ago. It, uh, that's how old it is. Uh, west for the charming outback towns or east for the spectacular Morton Island. So it really is the gift that keeps on giving. Now, the University of Queensland, or UQ, is a premier research and teaching institution based in Brisbane, known for producing marine bio biology and environmental research. UQ has a strong reputation for global student ex exchange and welcomes students from around the world. Um, UQ has three unique campuses. So there's the St. Lucia campus, which is the main campus, and that's nestled in the bend of the Brisbane River, the only university on the Brisbane River. Hurston, which is just minutes outside the CBD, and Gatton campus. Now, Gatton is situated an hour outside of the city on a working cattle station. Uh, it's over a 1,000 hectares of dairy, pig, crop, and grazing units, so an incredible, um, incredible opportunity there. UQ has over 4,000 courses to choose from and has won more teaching awards than any other Australian institution. The makeup of the UQ student population is a great reflection of the city with over 21,000 international students from 142 countries. Popular courses include coral, coral reef ecology and conservation, Aboriginal architecture, Australian vertebrates, and my favourite unit that I think I've come across, the history of the supernatural. So within the University of Queensland, we also offer the Marine Biology and Terrestrial Ecology Program, or MBTE. Now, this program was created specifically for UC students who were looking to gain field, field work and research experience in this particular field of study. In this, in this program, students divide their time between the classroom in Brisbane and participate in several day and week long field trips in locations, including the outback, rainforest and reefs. Students conduct their own research project under the guidance of the University of Queensland School of Bi Biological Sciences professors. The program really is a great combination for students looking to explore the and experience Australia uh, and the natural environment while also learning, earning academic credit. This is by far the most popular program that's offered in the country. Uh, at the moment, we have 43 students undertaking this, this particular program. Um, Wrapping up, this has just been a small glimpse at some of the opportunities that are on offer to UC students throughout the country. Uh, I want to thank you for your time today, and I would encourage you to continue asking questions through Slido and reach out if you'd like to discuss anything in more details. I'd now like to send you from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere and meet Noah and the team in Mexico. Well, thank you, Luke, for that excellent presentation and representation of Australia. I learned uh, what, what a beige city is, um, and CBD, meaning the Central Business District, or the downtown, I assume. Um, well, thank you, and uh, 
today we're going to talk about Mexico in a bigger context of coming from the top down uh, about the relationship we've had with Mexico for 54 years now with UCAP. Uh, and we wanted to spell some myths because uh, I'll talk in a second about some trends in Mexico. We're going to talk about UCAP's fortunate, uh, excellent presence that we have in Mexico City and the staff that we have there uh, to support our students, staff, and programming. And then we're going to go over all the programs that we offer in Mexico and talk about some unique aspects of them related to social aspects, cultural diversity, and the common entrance through the immersive language programs. But briefly, as we get started, I do want to highlight some data points that are, I think are very important to demonstrate the opportunities to increase uh, UC study abroad participation in Mexico. And there's a couple charts here. Uh, the first one is a chart that represents the overall trend of UCAP students we've sent to Mexico since 1999. And as a total, uh, you can see that there was a, a high, high numbers of students uh, all the way through about 2000. Uh, seven, and then there's a precipitous decline that happens from 2008 through 2012, and a slow recovery right before the pandemic. Um, these two lines here represent percentages. The top line is a percentage of all uh, students in the U.S. who study abroad in Mexico relative to how many students study abroad overall. So that's a percentage here on the right, and you can see that. And this gray line is the percentage of UCAP students who study abroad in Mexico versus uh, all the students who study on UC, UCAP programs. So you can see that back in 1999, 2000, we were about the same place. And then UCAP was, while we did have high participation numbers, we were underperforming as, uh, as an entity relative to the rest of the country in percentages, if we're looking just at a relative ratio of what participation looked like in Mexico. So as Michelle mentioned, one of our strategic goals about the opportunity to increase participation with Mexico was first to just bring our UCAP numbers in line with what we feel is possible with the rest of the country and hopefully go beyond that. So we're looking to recover a little bit. And this chart here uh, demonstrates a, a pretty quick recovery, at least on our contemporary Mexico program. So this program, which was launched in 2015, saw, saw some growth and was, was part of the recovery of participation in Mexico. And this year in 2023 underwent a rapid growth, doubling the numbers from last year and a 50% increase over the all-time high. So that's a very uh, positive trend we feel and something that bodes well for the future of programming there. We do have a couple updates about our programs. Uh, one is that there is a language requirement at our partner UNAM, which we'll, we'll talk more about, but the, the language requirement has made some challenges for our participation. Um, we are working with our campus partners and uh, our on-site personnel are working diligently with UNAM to mitigate uh, the challenges we're facing there. And then we did recently change uh, the name of one of our programs, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation from Global Health to Community Health. But now I want to introduce two uh, representatives from UCAP's Mexico uh, City Study Center. Veronica Tellez has been with UCAP for 29 years. Uh, She's worked with, I'm guessing, thousands of UCAP students, just looking at the numbers uh, on that graph there by now, and has an immense uh, track record and commitment to the program, the students, and, uh, and the opportunities that our students get to have at Mexico City. And Professor Lucia Reyes has been with UCAP in off and on for a total of 29 years, uh, going back to 1985. Uh, she's also an alumni of UC Riverside. So uh, welcome, Veronica. Welcome, Lucia. And uh, we're mm -hmm. going to get started with Mexico. Mexico is a world center of contemporary art, a mega diverse country, the 11th world economic, has over 60 indigenous languages and groups. All these filters into the program to speakers of national status and special field visits. UCP and Mexico's long-standing relationship is a reflection of the intertwined natural of our two countries, sharing the 10 largest world border, as well as a relevant series of history and contemporary issues as oil, energy, NAFTA, migration, safety, and security. Um, it's a pleasure to share with you today 
I will address two common beliefs that may come up when pondering whether to go to the Mexico Study Center. The first one, being in California, is Mexico is near enough, and I could perhaps go any any time. Yeah, indeed, we are, we're close, we're neighbors, and that's part of the reason why it's important to come um, through EAP, because it warrants students an academic and experiential entry unavailable otherwise. Another reason to come to Mexico is that um, students have exposure to Spanish and earn proficiency in the language, which is the second language spoken in the USA, um, which is bound to prove beneficial personally and professionally in the student's future. A study experience in Mexico will likely increase future professional opportunities uh, for which experience in a Latin American country is an asset. We've had um, student testimonies that talk about this. The second belief is that um, Mexico is unsafe, um, not in a comparative perspective. Please see the table um, to your right side below and note the rates presented in it. Figures speak for themselves. Also, not as a blanket statement. The degree of violence in the country varies by county, which is the, um, the map that you have down there, varies by county and in time. It is contingent upon the activities of the organized criminal groups which are fighting for territory. And to counter this belief, we have uh, Mexico City as a new hotspot for digital nomads, principally from the USA, a trend that began with the COVID um, pandemic and continues to, to increase. The UC EAP Mexico office systematizes all administrative issues regarding the students' well-being and smooth adaptation organizes and oversees field trips and other outings, helps understand administrative points both in Mexico and in regards to the students' pro programs in the UC system. The UC EAP Mexico Studies Center offers four programs and common immersion entry. During the five weeks entry and intensive language program, students can learn about Mexican contemporary history, Spanish language divided by the students' levels, including for heritage speakers, research methodology for field research programs students. Part of the intensive language program includes field visits that show the diversity and complexity of Mexico City. In this slide, we showcase a few of the outings we do with the students. To your right, the top right, um, this is a visit to Tlahuac, which is an agricultural traditional area in the city, um, in which the same cultivation method, the Mexicas, Mexica, same as Aztecs, um, the same cultivation method Mexicas used continues to exist. We visit with Don Tomás wearing the white shirt on your, um, on your screen. We visit with Don Tomás, who's a local third generation producer um, he explains to us both the cultivation method um, in the so-called floating gardens. So Chimilco is more popular than Tlahuac, but they're the same thing, except um, Tlahuac produces food for the city. And he also talks about his experience growing food in a post-NAFTA Mexico, pretty different. Um, his experience is very telling for him for the learning experience. Then we also visit Colonia Roma, which is a fashionable neighborhood where students find urban development of the city from the 1950s onwards. And it's also a zone that was very badly hit by the 1985 earthquake, um, the recovery from which helps explain our present social and political situation. So we cover several topics in our visit to Colonia Roma, um, another um, place we visit, which is highlighted here, the two, the two slides to your left, are uh, a visit to Faro, which literally means lighthouse. This is a project uh, for underprivileged population, which serves thousands of inhabitants of the eastern part of Mexico City. Faro um, hosts over 200 workshops and classes and has a variety of facilities, including a library, a computer club, a radio station, a daycare center. 
Our, visual, our visit usually includes a hands-on um, activity. You see our students um, on the bottom um, picture there. Um, taking part in one of the activities such as alebrije uh, construction. Alebrijes are this combination of animals, uh, papier mache type of um, arts and crafts that Mexico has developed. And our students also can and sometimes do voluntary work such as organizing the toy library. We have had some students do their internship at Faro, for example. To your right, what you have is a picture of Tlatelolco that's um, like a, a double um, interest place. On the one hand, that's where the 1968 student massacre took place, which takes Mexico to its modern road um, in contemporary history. And it's also called the Plaza of the Three Cultures because of the pre-Hispanic ruins, which you can barely see in the picture, the colonial church, and then the modern architecture back there. It's also a place where the earthquake hit really hard. Um, to finish um, the visit, when, um, I will continue to talk about complexity and diversity. To finish the visit, the groups make of downtown Mexico. Um, everyone attends the Ballet Folklorico. Can we have the next slide, please? The students um, attend the Ballet Folklorico at the Palacio Nacional de Bellas Artes, which is your picture to the left, top left. Um, this museum and, and theater houses a large art museum, as well as murals by the famous four uh, painters slash muralists of post-revolutionary Mexico. Another highlight is visit visiting the pyramids of Tutihuacan on the bottom with a specialized guide who explains the significance of this incredible site and mentions the newer excavations and findings. Um, throughout Mexico City, to, uh, on the bottom right, you can see our students um, visiting this that I'm going to talk about, which is throughout Mexico City, finding street art and very complex murals and graffiti um, are found in downtown Mexico and also in other areas, um, stemming from this long drawn, drawn inheritance of Mexican art. Finally, on the bottom slide, we see from the student's perspective, um, a site of Tepoztlan, a lively mountain town an hour away from the city. Can we, um, here I, we um, chose to show you how our students, this is the folkloric ballet. After the folkloric ballet finishes, the dancers come down and pick some people from the audience to dance with them. And literally everyone we see are our students, including Maria, who's dancing right here. Um, our students, because Veronica buys such beautiful places, the troupe um, picked our students to dance with them. They had a ball, as you, literally, as you can see. So I am going to talk about the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. Enrollment in UNAM provides students with full immersion into a Mexican academic environment. UNAM is inheritor of the title, the first University of Mexico. It was founded in the mid 1500s by Carlos de Pitt. As an autonomous entity, it aged from 1929. In 2007, UNESCO named it a World Heritage Site due to its campus rendering homage to the Mesoamerican tradition from an from an architectonical perspective. Its campus measures seven square kilometers, has 1,000 buildings and more than 100 libraries, including the Mexican National Library. It has Olympic sports facilities and an ecological reserve. It ranks second in Latin America. UNAM offers 133 careers divided into three areas, physics, maths, and engineering, biology, chemistry, and health sciences, social sciences, humanities, and arts. Besides the schools, UNAM has research centers and institutes. Also cultural activities as theater, music, ballet, museums, movies, and sport activities are open for all the students. With an UNAM student ID, this is over 200 museums in Mexico City.
I will talk about um, two other programs that Mexico has, like Veronica was saying at the beginning, or NOAA. Um, we have um, UNAM, Contemporary Mexico, and the Field Research Program. Um, the Contemporary Mexico program is taught fully in English, um, covering Mexican contemporary history. And then the students also have the classes of Spanish offering diverse levels, including, like Vero said before, for heritage speakers. It includes a cross-cultural and engagement mini course in order to help students adjust to this very intensive participation in Mexican life. The program includes, like said before, many field trips and visits, as well as a um, host of guest speakers as a complement to their history and Spanish classes. What we see here in the pictures are students. Here, the, the guy who's facing um, back to us is the guy that took us to Tlatelolco. He's explaining how the, we are in the church called Santiago Tlatelolco which is where the um, Aztec um, noble people were, were guided or were taught Spanish and where a lot of the codexes were written there. Um, the codexes that we now have uh, to understand pre-Hispanic history. And the rest are pictures of our students having fun in different places. In the bottom, we see students and professors um, chilling at the Museum of Art, National Museum of Art. Um, and then I will talk now about the field research program, um, which is pretty unique as it provides a hands-on field research opportunity for undergrad students. Um, students learn to develop and use ethnographic research tools, such as field notes, interviewing, collecting field data and or life histories. Um, and they learn to do participant observation the present placements for this program include some of the most culturally diverse Mexican states, Oaxaca on the bottom left um, and Yucatan on the bottom right, with an enormous diversity of indigenous groups and cultures. Um, Querétaro on the bottom left, um, on the top left, sorry. Querétaro is a cradle of Mexico's independence um, from Spain, as well as an example of colonial history and architecture. And then we also have Mexico City as a site with uh, myriad possibilities. In each of these placements, students work with an academic mentor. The program is stru structured into 12 weeks in which students' investigations go through the stages necessary to respond to research questions on which they work throughout their pre previous time at Casa California. And then at the end, they write a field report. The pictures here on the bottom right you have Patricia Mena with Alina, um, an FRP student that's presently with her in Oaxaca. Um, Patricia is the mentor. On the top, we have Juan to the left, um, who's the mentor for Yucatan. And then we have, um, I don't know, no, you'll have to tell me on the, on the top, I think that's Yucatan um, or in the whereabouts and the bottom has to be Merida, I presume. Um, in each of these placements, um, students work with a, an academic mentor. I just, um, we just saw Patricia and Juan for um, Oaxaca and Yucatan. Um, structured into this um, um, 12 weeks, the students present their projects to their mentors and then they slowly make their way through the research questions. Um, the students may focus the research on a breadth of topics as mentors guide methodologically and will direct students to experts as needed in order to provide sufficient background and theoretical orientation. Often the field research program has been key in directing EAP students into future fields of interest and expertise. The program ends when the students, with the students coming back to Mexico when they present their findings for the Mexico City faculty. Okay, our last program that we're gonna present on today and in Mexico is our Community Health, formerly Global Health program in Puerto Escondido, um, which is on the Pacific coast of Mexico in the state of Oaxaca. And this program is operated in collaboration with our partner, Child and Family Health International. 
Um, and this is a unique program because it's a six week program that takes place in Spanish, uh, but students uh, take Spanish language to supplement what they do uh, for a practicum, which is clinical rotations. And they participate in rotations at local medical clinics. Um, these are community health-based clinics that serve local and indigenous populations. And they have a unique opportunity to engage with local population, local medical doctors, uh, and work under the supervision of the local doctors in these clinics and visit multiple clinics uh, throughout the, the, the term of the program. Um, this is a pilot program. We just completed our second pilot. Um, so we we were successful and we will be looking now to grow the program in the ways we can since it's currently a limited capacity program, um, but a very high impact program uh, that is great for pre-med students, students looking to go into health related fields. Okay, so this concludes the presentation portion of our program uh, today featuring Australia and Mexico. And though we just scratched the surface, I hope you'll be uh, following up with us and looking at ways we can partner and enhance participation on UCAP programs in Australia and Mexico, and of course, throughout the world as well. And again, as this is in a strategic initiative, we hope to look uh, back three years from now and talk about the massive success that we were able to achieve with uh, the collaboration and support from all the system-wide stakeholders that we work with and our campus partners. We've put some contact information on this slide as well for our program specialists. Uh, if you want to follow up in more detail, uh, Amy and Lily can answer questions, very specific programmatic questions uh, related to these respective programs. I hope that you've had a chance to ask some questions in Slido, as Luke had indicated. And, and um, But uh, we also do invite you now to uh, ask some questions. Okay, question There's from question. Julie. Uh, yeah. What, uh, Lucia Enviro, could you share a research project that was a really standout project from your many years of experience? And this would be from the FRP, I imagine. Oh, you're on mute, Lucia. There. Vero, do you want to go? I, I can, can you say it, Lucia? I can think of a project by um, a student of Indonesian background. His name is Ron Juan Gantron. He went to um, to Chiapas in when we could use Chiapas as a placement. He went to Tapachula, and he did a wonderful project following the children who traveled alone over the border from Oaxaca. I'm uh, sorry, from Guatemala into Tapachula, Chiapas. His uh, his project won a prize actually um, from. There's a there's a UC um, prize graduate in, research. Yeah, I, I do not know the name exactly, but that was a wonderful a wonderful research that um, has kept with me because of the sensitivity with which Ron worked with the children. Um, there are several more. Yes, I remember one of the students. I don't remember the name, but uh, it may he did a research in Merida. Uh, about the economy, and she also wants uh, he also wants uh, a prize. And I don't I don't remember exactly, but uh, the government by the theory of of he or something like that. The name of he was Michael. I, I remember one Jose telling me about a project as well about where a student started a class a trash collection. In a, right. in a local city was able to right. mobilize uh, the, the city infrastructure to, to maintain this program and it, the program is still going on to this day. Uh, so very impressive projects with some very um, meaningful outcomes. I remember that as well, yeah. Um, um, question from Bonnie. Uh, oh, okay. Not a question, a comment. I just took a screenshot, Bonnie. Thank you for that. I'm gonna send that to Jenny and our um, marketing communications and engagement team and uh, see if she has any suggestions for pulling some of this from it. So thank you. A uh, question from Danilo. Uh, Mexico in the future, are there plans to include more Mexican cities to study in? Um, I, I think we currently we're limited to some degree by health and safety. I know that there are some 
very popular destinations in the past for Mexico, uh, Guadalajara, for example, aren't currently accessible. So right. we're working with our, and that, that includes also our previous FRP locations. Uh, so we're just working in Puerto Escondido, Oaxaca, um, Querétaro, Merida, um, and Mexico City at the moment. And I would say Noah and the Veronica are looking right now at proposing another option in Mexico for us to look at. It's being discussed right now in program development. There's nothing final yet, but we are looking to try to see other uh, possibilities in Mexico. So that is part of our initiative for this, you know, the the five locations, trying to see what we can expand in and um, what, you know, really our current students are seeking and wanting. So. Hopefully we'll have more information, Danilo, soon. If you have uh, suggestions, we're always open to them as well. Look, Le Sharon read your mind. Oh. <laughs> she already gave you some. <laughs> Thank you, Le Sharon. Um, Bonnie, one question. Do you are you still on? I'm not sure if you are, but yeah, I'm just gonna I'm here. okay, good. Hey, when you're going back to your suggestions about what to include, you know, to dispel the myths, is there anything in particular that stands out to you that you would recommend when we share this with the marketing team? I mean, I think the one that really sparked me was the stats. So I don't know, that could be kind of a sensitive area, but where it mm -hmm. showed sort of the, was it homicide rates or something? Oh, you yeah. know, maybe not those exact ones, or I don't know if we have to, you know, I don't know what we have to do because it could be a little tricky, but I just think so many people think there's just so much crime and so much just everything and seeing those things in comparison in real life, I think could dispel some of those myths. But also all the others, the pro, the the great activities. I mean, sometimes that might be video production, right? Showing um, live students going to, um, to these festivals and all these amazing things that we all know on this call, but that students need to see. Great feedback. Thanks. I'm taking notes as we go. Appreciate that. And I know Lucia had some more detailed information about. Uh, that was some of the maps that she showed where crime is more prevalent versus the areas that are, are safe, really safe. Uh, so that that's information that we could work with uh, Sia to, to follow up on. And some more of the articles demonstrating the, the migration, the digital nomads. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that, Noah? There's actually, may I please just add something? Oh, of course, yeah. There's actually a presentation that um, a guest speaker does for us, um, for all the groups in which um, he talks about this very um, delicate issue. He does it in such a way that he shows through statistics and how, and through different maps, how um, the situation changes. For Mexico, I could share that presentation with you and you can see what's, pertinent to use um, in which context. Thank you, Lily. She, uh, we, we have a recent Instagram story from our student who's in Oaxaca at the moment. So mm -hmm. uh, that if you can guide students to that, I think it's a really, it's a one hour Instagram story. So it's, it's really in depth, um, but I think shows the, the, the passion that, that, that our student is is feeling with that program. And we also sneak preview, we have a Instagram takeover taking place in Merida upcoming as well. Mm -hmm. um, Chrissy has a question about um, Australia. Uh, any plans to expand to uh, Perth or Northern Queensland? Uh, hey, Chrissy, I'll answer it super fast. We have less than a minute. Right now, no, we're just looking to really, we have a ton of capacity in the locations we offer right now. And we're trying to be cognizant of the fact that students say we already have a lot of options and it's overwhelming. So at this moment, we're not looking to expand in those locations. We have a lot of great opportunities in the existing locations. So we'd love to try to get um, more students going there before we see a, a need to expand even further and have even more options available. Yes, you're welcome. Hope that wasn't too fast, but I thought we had a few seconds left. I guess we have more. We should probably close up. Um, Parisia sure. partner. Yes. Thank you, Paulette. Always helpful to have the history. <laughs> this is perfect. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, everyone have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope it was useful. If you think of anything else or have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. Have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you.